I wanted to continue on talking about uh, modern philosophy. And so I think we wrapped up on Descartes, okay? And so what I want to go on to is idealism slash rationalism. Um, and this uh, takes things in an interesting direction. I think with Descartes, you can kind of understand what he's saying and it fits into our more empirical way of looking at things. He's trying to be empirical. And, and as I discussed before, you know, it's, we're right on the cusp of the, of the scientific revolution and Descartes is feeling that and getting on board with that, but he's still tied to Aristotelian scholasticism. And, uh, and so, He's either pandering to that view, or maybe he's still kind of stuck. You know, he has one foot in Aristotelian scholasticism and one foot in empiricism, and then it creates some, you know, some some vagueness and ambiguity, and maybe even some contradictions in his way of thinking. But he's trying to work it out, and I think it's uh, it's interesting. You know, it's interesting to us even today to try to get inside of his head and think, you know, what is he, what is he trying to say? And he points to this big issue that I, I asked, I think at the last, of, at the end of the last video, and I want you to be thinking about, you know, uh, does the mind rule the body or does the body rule the mind? Which is more dominant? Is the mind in control of the body? Is your mind in control of your body or is your body in control of your mind? And that's kind of the fundamental question. And, and <clears throat> besides that, a, a more metaphysical question, is it your mind or your soul that makes you a person or is it your body that makes your, you a person? And you might want to think about that in relation to animals is are you simply another kind of animal or is there something unique about the human and the ability to think? And that's the way that Descartes is thinking about it is like humans can think in a way that other animals can't. And so the human being is essentially, now thinking in this Aristotelian way, substantially a thinking being that is somehow, and this is what he has trouble working out, is how does a thinking substance, which is immaterial and doesn't exist within space, right? A thinking thing doesn't need to exist anywhere in particular. And it's not like you can, you can divide a thinking thing in half and then have two halves of the thinking thing. Uh, it's just totally, not part of the physical realm of extension. And he's thinking of extension as geometric extension along the lines of his mathematical work, um, uh, the geometry. So he's thinking of length, uh, or maybe we think of length, width, and then depth, right? In three dimensions. Uh, a thinking thing doesn't have any of those dimensions. It's just something that's out there, but he wants to say that it's attached to the body. And then sometimes he wants to say that it's, well, it's really coextensive in terms of extension, length, width, and depth. Uh, it's coextensive with the body in some way, but you know, he has a real hard time getting specific about it. And that's just the nature of the problem. You know, once we start to buy into this thinking that there's a thinking substance, the soul, the mind on the one hand, and then the body, the animal part of the person on the other, then we run into these problems. That's just quite natural. And, 
And so, uh, you know, I want you to be thinking about, well, how do you think about that? Do you think that you have a soul? Or do you think of yourself as purely just a body? Are you nothing but, you're just an animal and you have a body. And, and for Descartes now, he goes so far to say that animals are basically like machines. And that animals don't have souls. Uh, would you say that? Would you say that, you know, your favorite pet or, you know, uh, a, a sweet little lamb or something, you know, a polar bear doesn't have a soul, you know, and, and does that mean we can just manipulate them or destroy them as we, as we like? Um, this, is, this is important. And if you believe that human beings don't have souls, and they're basically just like animals and maybe just machines, just biological machines. Is it okay to manipulate, exploit, and uh, slaughter human beings? These are all questions that come up in the whole complex of ideas that Descartes is drawing our attention to. And that's why people, you know, find it interesting because it's not too hard to get in the door. It's very hard to sort out the details but it's not too hard to get in, in the door on this conversation. Okay, so be thinking about those things. And then, um, and, and, and then those, those are gonna be questions that are the focus of this treatment of, of uh, modern philosophy. And, and, uh, and we'll see, you know, that's what I'm going to focus on throughout the rest of this presentation, this series of videos, is thinking about those issues. And the rationalists take that in an interesting direction. Um, and this is the beginning of what Marx refers to as German idealism or German ideology. And I have a link to the, I think it's just to the Wikipedia page where they discuss his arguments uh, in his essay on German ideology. This is what he's talking about. This is sort of the start. There's Descartes, which is, he's kind of breaking the mold and introducing weird questions. And then there's uh, idealism or rationalism. And this gets adopted by German philosophers very heavily. And as we move into the 18th century, the 1700s, philosophy begins, well, ultimately, it doesn't really begin to be dominated, but ultimately at the end of the century is totally dominated by German philosophy, and that's German ideology. So we have Immanuel Kant, who comes on the scene at the, in the later quarter of the 18th century, and he sort of uh, changes philosophy forever. And from that point forward for several decades, um, philosophy just is German ideology. And so when Marx criticized that, criticizes that and breaks from German ideology, he's really breaking from the main current of philosophy at the time. Okay, so uh, let me get into this. Um, so Anton Arnaud is one of the people that uh, published a response to Descartes' meditations. And he has some very pointed um, criticisms of Descartes, some, some good uh, rational, uh, let's say logical um, arguments against Descartes. And so that's sort of part of this conversation that Descartes starts uh, with the meditations. Um, and Arno is very much an Aristotelian. Okay. And so he's fighting Cartesianism now, which becomes like a school of thought. And Descartes has a lot of followers who are just like, oh, this guy's a genius. And they're like, let's throw away Aristotelianism and let's be Cartesians. And that's very strong for, for a few decades. Um, it creates quite a splash all over Europe. And Arno is one of these people who's fighting 
uh, to preserve Aristotelianism and scholasticism. Uh, and he doesn't have really anything new to contribute. He's just the kind of standard Aristotelian. Uh, but he is good at argumentation. I mean, he's a, he's a good uh, Aristotelian. I mean, he's skilled at what he's doing. Okay. Um, Baruch Spinoza, uh, Spinoza is a, um, a Jewish philosopher. Uh, he is a, a, a glass grinder. Uh, that's what he does by profession. And then on the side, he's writing philosophy and he writes one of the most important uh, books in philosophy at this time. And it's something that people still go back to now um, quite frequently to, to re-examine what Spinoza said. Uh, sometimes it totally falls out of favor, but it has a way of always kind of coming back because uh, he, he, sort of jumps in on this Cartesian conversation, but takes it in a very different direction. And what he what he he does is he suggests um, so remember that part of Descartes' argument in the meditations is this uh, you know rehashing of Saint Anselm's argument uh, for the existence of God. Uh, which, you know, argues from the definition of God, you get such and such. Uh, Spinoza um, develops a system that's, that's quite different, and, but, um, but Cartesians, under, he, he's able to frame it in a Cartesian way that makes people really take it seriously. And what he argues is that really uh, you know, so there's this mind body problem that I mentioned just at the beginning of this lecture just now. So his way of sorting that out is to say, well, the whole world, the whole universe, the whole physical universe has a soul. And that soul of the universe is God. And this is very Aristotelian, as we saw. That's basically what Aristotle believed is that there's a world soul um, and the world soul is perfectly at rest and per perfectly rational and is engaged only in self-contemplation. But out of the, out of the substance of God or, or, or out of the, out of the, uh, the entelechy of God unfolds the universe. And, and so the physical universe is, a, is the formal manifestation of God. And God is uh, the material cause and the formal cause of the world, right? God is the substance of the world, which has a material aspect, that's the physical universe, and a, a formal aspect, which is this rational, perfectly at rest, uh, self-contemplating spirit. And notice that God in this Aristotelian view is a thinking substance. If you think of God as separate from the universe, God, the, the formal cause of God is a thinking substance, self-contemplating. Okay. Uh, Baruch, Baruch Spinoza very much believes that and, and, um, and tries to explain it in a more common sense way and a way that appeals to Cartesians. And, um, and, and then what this means is that we're always surrounded by God and interacting with God when we interact with anything in the world, when we interact with nature, when we a pet a bunny uh, when we have a conversation or give a hug to one of our, our friends. Um, we are surrounded and interacting with God in all these physical interactions, which are also spiritual interactions. And, uh, and the big 
the big watchword for Spinoza is imminence, that God is imminent in the physical reality that we see all around us. God isn't separate out in some other realm and then occasionally, you know, or accidentally checks in on us. We're living inside of God. Um, and, which means, which then means though that a tree has an entelechy and the tree is part of the formal cause of God, but then that means that the spirit of God in some partial ways is, is the spirit of the tree. And then people accuse Baruch Spinoza of being a pantheist, that he believes that there's all these gods all over the place, that a tree has a sort of entelechy within it, as I've discussed when I discussed Aristotelianism. And then people want to say, well, what he's proposing is kind of pantheism. And so more traditional uh, Christians, especially maybe, you know, now we're getting into the Protestant era. So we're getting people who are just newly theologians that are not trained in the Aristotelian way, not trained in philosophy. They're just looking at the Bible and they start to think about God as being like a guy up in the sky. And, um, and they don't like this idea of imminence because it sounds way too uh, pagan um, and, and non-Christian for them. And it doesn't help that Baruch Spinoza is a Jew. Okay. Uh, because, of course, we've seen that Jews were uh, traditionally persecuted, especially after the rise of the Spanish Empire. in the previous century. <clears throat> okay, so Spinoza is interesting. He has some interesting ideas. And, and again, people get intrigued by this quite frequently. Um, and, and what I wanna point to is that it is a way of salvaging Aristotelianism. Okay. All right, so I think I, I wanna cut that off and just leave this as a separate segment. And then I'll talk about Leibniz because I want to get a little more involved with uh, Leibniz.